You are listening to an American Free Press podcast. Joining me on the line is Colin Flaherty, the award-winning journalist and author of the book White Girl Bleed a Lot. Colin, thanks for joining us today. Happy to be here. Colin, we spoke several months ago on your book, terrific book, White Girl Bleed a Lot. The edition that I had was called The Return of Racial Violence and How the Media Ignore It. Has that been changed a little bit, or is that still the subheading? That's still the subheading. A new edition of the book will be out in October. Lots of new stuff, lots of new links to new videos, and it'll be published by WND Books, so it'll be a big book. Yeah, it's going to be a big coming out, and that's World Net Daily, right? Yes. Okay, great. The reason that I wanted to speak to you today is because, well, the book is about the epidemic of racial violence that's sweeping the nation and has been for a while. Of course, we stumbled on that really almost by accident. You've documented in the book hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of cases where blacks are just going up to those who are less able to defend themselves. At least that's what I got from the book. It doesn't matter if they're white or they're Asian as long as they can't defend themselves. And they're beating on them and doing other nasty things. Am I right about what I just said? I just yeah, I documented more than a thousand examples of black mob violence, more than a hundred cities all over the country. That's half of the book. The other half of the book is how the press covers it, how the local media covers it, how they ignore it, condone it, sometimes even lie about it. Yeah. You have, I'm sure, been paying close attention to the Zimmerman murder trial yes. because of how it relates to your research. And, of course, Zimmerman just the other day was found innocent of all charges. As of yet, it seems like there are not any at least large-scale rioting across the United States. There have been pockets of rioting and protesting. What did you think might happen prior to the reading of the verdict? My big interest in the Zimmerman trial was all the media surrounding it, and they kept saying one thing that wasn't true. The Zimmerman trial is, of course, a touchstone for how black men are treated in the criminal justice system. So everybody was used saying this one thing, that black people and white people smoke marijuana in the same amount, but black people are arrested four times more often. I heard this 10 times yesterday on MSNBC. It's not true. The arrest numbers might be true, but if you dig down into the original source of the black and white used pot in the same amount, you come to a study, a federal study, where federal bureaucrats go into a house and they ask everybody in the house, do you use drugs? It's called self-reporting. Absolutely not a valid way of determining drug use. There's only one way to determine accurately if somebody's using drugs. You have to test them. There are no tests, massive tests that compare black and white drug use. There are dozens of tests on this whole topic of self-reporting. Every one, every study says, listen, this is bogus because we asked people and then we tested and the difference is enormous. And of course, you just wrote an article for frontpagemag.com, does racism really cause more black drug arrests? And this was, of course, July 10th, and you were alluding to that article, I would imagine, right? Yeah, and this whole topic of one group getting over-policed is kind of a basis of critical race theory. It says racism is everywhere, racism is permanent, and you see it popping up a lot more. And this one statistic is the big cornerstone linchpin for the whole thing, proof that we live in a racist system that treats black people in a racist fashion, when even the most ardent supporter of critical race theory has to know that the differences among races and crime rates is enormous, it's clear, and it's not disputable. If anybody wants to sit here and disagree whether the murder rate for blacks is eight times higher than whites, or if you want to say it's seven rather than eight, okay, I'll say fine. But everything's between five and 800 wow. percent of crime rates, and it's just enormous. Wow, that you Now, of course, this research that you did when you came out with the book, it kind of thrust you into the spotlight of this topic. And I imagine that it's somewhere that I guess many times you probably don't want to be, right? The answer is yes and no. I don't have any problem with putting my stuff out there and saying this is the truth. I think a lot of people think that I'm more of a target than I actually am because I don't do causes. I don't do solutions. I don't do apologies either. I just say, listen, people, this happened. And I just go boom, 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 all over the country, hundreds and hundreds of times. And 10 years ago, we would have been sitting here going, well, Colin, it sounds good, but, you know, it's just you talking. But now we have videotapes, and the videos is worse than anything that you and I can make up. And so, yeah, this book's getting out there, and the liberals, the critical race theory people are trying to, like, take it apart, but there's nowhere to go because they can't argue with me. They have to argue with all the videos, and that's a little more difficult. <laughs> yeah, I think they just ignore them, right? This is very interesting, what you were saying, that this one topic, this one area, this one study was being used as, like, the linchpin here for evidence that we live in a racist society. 
Who's actually promoting this? Who are the bad guys in this? Well, everybody's the bad guy. I don't know who was the first one to grab this study and use it in a way it's not supposed to be used, but the study is done by the federal government. It's in the article what it's called. It's called like Federal Household Survey or something like that. And I think just meant to give federal bureaucrats an idea of what kind of drug money we should be spending this month. It's not meant to be a really piercingly accurate description of who's using drugs. And if you look at these studies, here's the crazy thing about one of the studies. They did a huge study about people people using drugs. They just were testing the self-reporting. Huge study. And they actually said in this study published in a major peer-reviewed journal called Journal of Addiction, they said there are a couple of indicators for how we know people are not telling the truth about their drug use. One, were they in prison? Two, are they living with their friends or at home? Three, are they African-American? And <laughs> You know, it's like I saw that and I said, oh, man, when I start saying this, people are going to freak. But it's right in the report. Right. People are going to have to figure out another bogus fact because the idea that people are getting arrested in disproportionate amounts is bogus. Ask any cop, ask any teacher, what are the different rates of drug use among different racial groups? No one's going to tell you what's equal. Getting back to Trayvon Martin, did you have any particular preference on how the verdict was applied? My big thing was I just like watching the media and I just like to see who's telling the truth and who's not. And in the very beginning, we heard things that weren't true about Zimmerman, about what he was saying on the telephone, what his history is. And I was very disappointed. Now, I know some of this stuff can't be introduced in court, but this wasn't about court. This was about the court of public opinion, right? And so yesterday, I'm hearing all these people talk about Zimmerman being a little Trayvon being an angel and what's going to be his legacy. Listen, we know that Trayvon Martin was a thug, smoked pot. He used a codeine cocktail called Drank that you prepare with watermelon, fruit juice, and Skittles. Right. We know that he was involved in burglary. We know that he was involved in vandalism. We know that when he was shot, he was on suspension from school for doing some bad things. Listen, I'm not saying any of that says that the kid should be shot or not shot. But what I'm saying is I don't know why people on national TV can get up there and say all these things and wonder if no one is actually going to know the truth about it. Right. What do you think is motivating the mainstream media? Because it's very clear now, and it should be absolutely crystal clear to everybody that pays even the smallest amount of attention to this topic, that the mainstream media does move in lockstep. It's rare if they diverge from the path that they're all on for some reason or reasons. But why do you think it is that they have wanted to portray Martin through the picture of him being, I guess, a 14-year-old kid, sweet and everything, versus the picture of him with the gold teeth and the weapon, smoking the marijuana, the nasty things that he has said? What do you think is motivating the mainstream media? to do that. I don't know. A week ago, I wrote a column for WND. It was kind of like supposed to be kind of like half lighthearted, but people didn't take it that way. But the opening line was, hey, I owe a lot of people an apology, a big apology, because a couple of days before that, had anybody told me that Obama and the Department of Justice were sending community organizers to Florida to organize rallies and protests and to foment racial division, I would have said, you are a cuckoo bird. That is a conspiracy theory of the highest order. It's right. stupid. Well, guess what? That is what they, can you believe that's what they did? When I heard about that, I was floored. I still am floored about it. I can't grasp it. I don't have any frame of reference for it. It's so why the people and the media can't get a candid and a truthful thing about race. I don't know. All I know is they have seminars about how to report race, and most of it involves don't demonize and don't criminalize black people, even if you know, we catch them doing a lot of bad stuff. So the journalists themselves are put through seminars on how to handle this stuff. Oh, yeah. It's not like they're hiding it. I mean, if you look at the Society of Professional Journalists website, go look at that. Go look at all the training on diversity. They're very proud of everything that they have done. There was a to kind of like misrepresent different crime rates among different racial groups. You remember I did a story a few months ago, but somebody else did it a few years ago, about that TV show Cops? Mm -hmm, right. You remember that story? Sure, I sure do. They were presenting whites in a more prominent position of being involved in crimes than blacks on purpose. Yeah, they had to flip the whole ratio, just so the producer said, just so his liberal buddies in Hollywood wouldn't give him a hard time. I read that and I thought, that's, I heard him saying it on video. I mean, that's unbelievable. So yeah. we live in a situation where most people find it very difficult to have a sane conversation about race. Do mm. you think it's purely being done for commercial reasons, or do you think there's some kind of other hidden, maybe nefarious reason why it's being done by all of the mainstream media, which are owned by only a few big prominent families? I don't know the answer to that question, but here's what I do know. One, that the psychiatrists tell us we are only as sick as our secrets, and there's nothing that we're more secretive about than race. 
when people talk about race in this country, they talk about it all over the country. Every time I do, people are coming up with, you know, these wacky ideas of what's happening out there. And I'm just sitting here going, listen, I don't know. I mean, I'm just a guy on the street corner saying, hey, there's a car crash. And everybody around me is going, no, it's not a car crash, Colin. You're imagining it. Right. So that's why I wrote the book. You're paying very close attention to what's happening across the United States. And I don't even know if anything's happening around the world over Trayvon Martin. What has been happening? What have you uncovered since the verdict was released? Well, there is some stuff that's been in the paper. There's stuff in Oakland, stuff in Los Angeles. I listened to the scanners. And the funny thing about the scanners, listening to scanner traffic on the Internet, that's pretty interesting. I was listening to Indianapolis. I was listening to Chicago. And there may or may not be protests about Trayvon. But last night in Chicago, for example, just got this this morning. You know, there was a huge amount of black mob violence involving guns, involving fighting the police. It may have had nothing to do with Trayvon. This is something that happens every day in almost every city in America. Just the other day, for example, I was watching my little hometown cable TV channel, the city council, and this was never in the paper. One of the city councilmen came up and said, oh, yeah, I want to commend the police because during the downtown fireworks celebration in Wilmington on the 4th of July, the police were pelted with M80 and bottle of dynamite rockets or something like that. It was like, that's black mob violence that no one ever talks about. It happens so often, people just shrug their shoulders and go, well, I don't know, man. I don't know what it's all about. Amazing. That's one thing. But then, when we watch the coverage of Trayvon, then it's presented as something 180 degrees different. That the people who are the predators, the black mobs, somehow they're the victims. And the people who notice it, people like me, somehow we're the predators for noticing. So it's a funny <laughs> world we live in, Dave. Funny and got some other words for it. Now, <laughs> out of all of the cities that you have been very carefully watching, what are the top five cities across the country for black racial violence or for black violence against other races? Or even, I guess they even go after their own race, right? There's a lot of black mob violence against people from every race. Here's the story this year. The story this year is not Baltimore, Philly, Chicago, New York, Miami, all the big East Coast cities. The story this year is the smaller cities where you don't think of it as a place of, you know, great urban drama. Milwaukee might have the worst racial violence in America. All eyes in America are on Indianapolis this week because they're having the Indiana Black Fair, which where violence is a regular feature of life. I wrote a column a few weeks ago for WND where I just named on the last couple weeks all these small cities all over the country that feature large-scale black mob violence. Greensboro, North Carolina is a nasty place for racial violence. It's not just a couple of kids sitting on the corner giving cops dirty looks. These are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people on the street, destroying property, beating people up, and it's on video. It's amazing. So have any of the cities that you're talking about, Milwaukee, Greensboro, Baltimore, Philly, have any of them erupted in pro-Trayvon protests that you know of? I haven't followed the protests. I'm just trying to follow if the place breaks out in violence. And if it happens the next day or so, it's fine. But I think I'm kind of watching it for the entire summer. You know what life is like now for a cop? And it's been this way for a couple of years. I get a lot of cops who read my book, by the way. I'm just telling you, cops are very enthusiastic readers of my book. Mm -hmm. So I get stuff from New York, Chicago, Houston, Seattle, Portland, Milwaukee from cops. They're always sending me stuff. So the other day, I called every one of them, called like 10 cops that really are big fans of the book. I said, what happens when you pull a black person over or when you stop a black person on the street? So what happens? They all said the same thing. They said, the only reason you stop me is because I'm black. Hmm. This is a regular feature of life daily for cops. I think teachers experience it a lot. I was reading an article this morning how a teacher was talking about that's a regular feature of her life now. And they have big courses about how teachers have to learn about critical race theory so they can better get rid of their own white racism. So this whole racial thing is on a very deep, you know, it's also right on the surface all over the country. Yeah, because the cops are on the front line there. They can do what you're talking about. And they know that it's not reported the way that it probably should be because then it could prepare readers a little better for what's out there. Could you imagine, and this happens all the time, and I read it in your book, tourists that are going to Chicago or wherever it is, all of a sudden they're in the middle of a black mob and they're getting pounded upon. Let the listeners know why it is. Of course, we talked about this before, but the title of your book is White Girl Bleed a Lot. Let them know why that is the title. That's from Milwaukee, another place where black mob violence happens all the time, including several times a summer. So it was the 4th of July, two summers ago, 50 to 100 black people looted a convenience store on video. Video. They moved over to a nearby park where there were like 10 or 15 white kids having a holiday picnic. Beat the stuffing out of these kids. And at one point, a black woman was standing over a white woman. She pointed down at the white woman and kind of the other hand pointed to all of her friends. And she said, laughing, white girl bleed a lot. 
they all thought that was very funny. Yeah, without, of course, any of the other words that might go <laughs> go kind of well, like, hey, look at that white girl. She's bleeding a lot. No, white girl bleed a lot. White girl bleed a lot. That's what she yeah. said. Yeah. And this is what people are learning in hundreds of school districts around the country now. If you and I say white girl bleed a lot is not proper English and we think it sounds dumb and stupid, that means you and I are racist and you and I have a lot of work to do to get rid of our white supremacy. That is the cause of so much evil on this planet. Right, because we want people to speak and write proper English. English. So this is not just being campaigned from the mainstream media, but it's also being campaigned from the educational system. Hundreds and hundreds of school districts. Look up the word on the internet. I wrote an article, a couple of articles about it, easy to find. Look up the word courageous conversations in Seattle or San Leandro, California. You'll see teachers talking about this exact topic. They're very proud of the fact that they're telling everybody about white supremacy, white racism, institutional racism, and how they're teaching their kids that and how they're trying to remove it from their school system. They've had a couple of places where the parents have revolted. In Arkansas, in Little Rock, the governor came down and took over the whole school district and said, you're nuts. They outlawed it in Arizona last year, but it's still happening all over the country. Another huge story. Colin Flaherty, award-winning journalist, author of White Girl Bleed a Lot, The Return of Racial Violence and How the Media Ignore It. Colin, I want to thank you so much for the time you spent explaining all this to listeners. I would encourage the listeners to go back and listen to the interview I did with Colin several months ago on the book. A lot of background information in there. Colin, thanks so much for your time and looking forward to talking to you again in the future. Thank you, Dave.